Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin Smith. Tonight, despite warnings that drilling in the country's rainforest would be an environmental catastrophe, DR Congo launches a much criticized plan to auction off oil and gas blocks. Also, as Senegal gears up for legislative polls this weekend, top opposition figures accuse Macky Sall's government of trying to stack the deck in his favour by banning protests and the participation of top names. And Zimbabwe starts selling gold coins in a bid to tackle hyperinflation, their debut as public confidence in local currency plummets. But first, despite warnings from environmental groups that drilling in peatlands and forests could amplify global warming, on Thursday, DR Congo opened an auction of exploration licenses for 30 oil and gas blocks in the West. Clément Bonnero has more. Of the 27 oil blocks put up for auction, nine are in the huge central basin region, which sits on rainforests and peatlands, which are among the world's most important carbon sinks. They store about 30 billion tonnes of carbon, which is equivalent to about 82% of annual global energy-related carbon dioxide emissions. Scientists and environmental groups warn of devastating consequences for the environment should those areas be disturbed. Developing these activities uh, industrial exploitation pétrolière dans ces zones là industrial oil exploitation uh, will impact biodiversity à la uh, à des impacts à la fois sur la biodiversité que regorge it will also release billions of tons of carbon trapped underground into the atmosphere uh, les milliards et les milliards de tonnes qui sont séquestrées a petition launched earlier this month by Congolese and international NGOs such as Greenpeace has gathered more than 100,000 signatures. But for the Congolese government, the priority is economic development. 100,000 signatures versus 100 million inhabitants. The choice is clear. The option we have taken is to help the Congolese population to try to improve their daily lives through economic development. NGOs cannot dictate how a sovereign country is led. The government estimates that the oil blocks could bring in 2,000 billion US dollars in revenue. It remains to be seen, though, whether this will indeed benefit the Congolese people. DR Congo consistently ranks among the most corrupt countries in the world, and despite its vast mineral wealth, three quarters of its population live on less than $1.90 a day. Clément Bonero there for us. Now, after days of fatal protests against peacekeepers in DR Congo on Thursday, the U.S. called for more protection for U.N. staff and sites. Unrest has died down, but at least 12 civilians and three U.N. personnel have already been killed this week in protests. Sophie Lamont has more. This strategic road is deserted. It connects Bakura to Uvira in eastern Congo. Military personnel patrol throughout Thursday to stop the spread of protests from one city to the other. They started in Goma on Monday before erupting in Beni and Butembo. Protesters also clashed with police in Uvira on Wednesday. There, four people were fatally electrocuted after being hit by a high-voltage power line. This says that it fell after UN troops fired warning shots and hit an electrical pole. I don't have any evidence that MONUSCO troops were uh, firing at civilians. But again, we want to make sure that we do an investigation with the government to determine exactly where the shooting came from. This market, usually packed, was completely empty on Thursday. The anti-UN demonstrations led to protest bans in eastern Congo and the restriction of movement. The UN's MONUSCO mission has 16,000 troops on the ground, but many Congolese criticize peacekeepers for failing to protect civilians against the dozens of armed groups that have long terrorized eastern provinces. Congo is our nation. Congo is for the Congolese. Ever since MONUSCO has been here, they have done nothing, nothing, nothing. People are getting killed every day. And while we are meant to have a UN mission to keep the people safe, the population is being massacred. They're being killed like sheep. Earlier this month, Kinshasa urged MONUSCO to pack its bags and leave. After more than three decades of activity, the UN and the Congolese government are working on an exit strategy for the MONUSCO. 
Well, after Cameroon and Benin, French President Emmanuel Macron wrapped up a three-country African tour with a trip to Guinea-Bissau on Thursday. There he met with the president, Umar Sissako Mbalo, who became chair of the West African bloc ECOWAS earlier this month. The region faces deepening security challenges with a ramping up of extremist attacks. Macron's pledged ongoing military support with possible joint missions, the training of regional armies and supply of equipment. Well, Senegal heads to the polls on Sunday for legislative elections. Many leading opposition figures have been barred from competing officially because of an error of printed on the proposed candidate lists. But that sparked accusations of foul play and deepened anger over protest bans. Our correspondents report. Dettier Fell is among the opposition leaders barred from taking part in Senegal's upcoming elections. But he's calling on his colleagues to fight on. Fell was briefly detained by police in June in what he believes is a crackdown on dissent. I was not arrested. I was kidnapped. You saw what happened next. I was unjustly imprisoned. There is violence against the opposition. There are arrests. Opposition figures have been eliminated ahead of the elections. In June, three people died during protests that had been officially banned. The clashes left analysts worried about the future of democracy in Senegal. Democratic culture here is weak, there is weak governance, and the state of human rights in this country is lamentable. I think we need to address these issues together peacefully. Tensions have eased off over recent weeks. The campaign period has passed without major incident. The government insists that Senegalese democracy remains healthy. The opposition is spreading propaganda to create distrust in the election and a strategy designed to loot the country. We will never accept that. Our democracy is strengthening, and I can sincerely say that our democratic model has matured. The opposition is worried that Macky Sall may seek a controversial third term in 2024. The Senegalese president has said he will address the question after the legislative elections. Well, Zimbabwe is literally going for gold in its fight back against runaway inflation. It's launched new coins made of the precious metal that will be tradable both nationally and overseas. But there is scepticism that the scheme could work. Camille Adelek with more. <laughs> Banking on the Midas touch to help curb inflation, Zimbabwe's new legal tender is a gold coin, which contains one troy ounce of the precious metal. The bank is today released if the first batch of 2,000 Mosotunia gold coins to the market. Local agents commenced selling the gold coin on an agent's basis at the initial price of 1,823 dollars and 80 cents per gold coin. Many people saw their savings wiped out in 2008 when inflation reached 5 billion percent and few trust the Zimbabwean dollar to this day. Most prefer to spend and save the more stable but scarce US dollar. The government hopes Zimbabweans can be convinced to switch to Mosatuna, which will have its value pegged to the international market rate for an ounce of gold. But locals are sceptical. The Zimbabwean government has repeatedly changed policies and systems, and people have lost their savings. There's been a lot of corruption. To read how this gold will solve any problems. Harari has brought back its local currency in 2019 after abandoning it for a decade but it has since lost so much of its value that many shops refuse to accept it. Well, South Africa has been experiencing between four and six hours of daily power cuts for almost two weeks now. They're the most severe since 2019 and are not only paralyzing businesses, but also raising serious questions about the country's industrial future. Our team reports. Entrepreneurs working in the commercial zone of this township outside Cape Town manage power cuts as best they can. Their schedules are dictated by the two to six hours of blackouts they face daily. When the lights are off, I go around, shop around for space. 
when they are on and back on the work. The generator is uh, so expensive. Like now the price of petrol, diesel is up. So the moment we buy a generator, we also taking the, the money out. And you promise a client uh, your work will be done in maybe three or five days. And then power outage, you do the job maybe for more than five days, you see. So I'm losing a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of clients here. The causes of the crisis are complex. Half of the generators of the country's 14 coal-fired power stations don't work. Corrupt and bankrupt, the state-owned utility's 40-year-old infrastructure is no longer fit for purpose. ESCOM's chief also claims that strikes have made things worse. Unfortunately, due to the unlawful strike, we have uh, suffered uh, significant backlogs and maintenance. We've also had to operate uh, the plants under conditions which are less than ideal. And uh, we therefore will take a number of weeks to fully recover from the strike. President Cyril Ramaphosa says he wants to speed up the transition to renewable energy, to see more private sector investment and to buy more electricity from neighboring countries. But experts are worried. Eight years ago, this journalist published a book predicting the power crisis. The power stations that were started 12, 13, 14 years ago, in 2007, 2008, they have still not been completed, they're still not finished, and the units that have been completed have been found to be deficient and to be severely problematic. In a country with the highest unemployment in the world, more than one million jobs have been lost to load shedding already. Alternatives must be found quickly to prevent further job losses. And Ethiopia celebrated its athletics team on Thursday as it returned from the U.S. Athletics Championships with a spectacular 10 medals. They came in second in the overall rankings at Oregon. Athletes from Tigray, which is at the center of a deadly conflict with the federal government, won three of the four gold medals and one of the silver, including the women's marathon winner, Gotitem Gwebreselesi. Well, congratulations to them. That is, though, all we have time for for Iron Africa. Thanks for joining us. Do so again. Take care.